Hi, this is Jeff Brown. Hi, I'm Ross Bentley. And guess what? This is this no dumb, dumb questions. Question. Yeah, there we go. I think we if perfected that one. En- <laughs> right. If you've paused enough for the internet connection to be paused right, we'll sync up. I think there's a 0.016 second difference in our discussion in our uh, internet connection. 0.016. Actually, I think the internet is worse than that, but why 0.016, Jeff? Uh, I I don't know. I might have lost the Daytona 24-hour by 0.016 last weekend, unfortunately. So that number is kind of stuck in my mind. It's about all I can think about lately. (laughs) 0.016. Yeah. Uh. Well, and and it's almost hard to use the word lost when you're that close. Like, I mean, yes, technically you lost. You're a loser, Jeff. <laughs> we, we did. We did. I, I just did the math. That's if we would have gone 0. 0.00002 seconds faster per lap, we would have won. Wow. Darn it. Darn it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Fortunately. Oh, well. Uh, well, for you and for me, um, Somebody happened to win overall. That was kind of pretty fun. Oh, yeah, yeah. A guy I know. Um, <laughs> I've known him for pretty much all of his life. Uh, pretty much. Um, yeah, yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Pretty much. Uh, yeah, Colin had had a pretty good weekend. Uh, it was good to see those guys and all the hard work. I have an insight into how much work they put in. Not that they put in more than anybody else, but... It's nice to see it pay off, and uh, and in his first opportunity with Acura and Meyer Shank and all of that, uh, get the win is pretty pretty cool as a as a family. Good weekend for the family. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I spent a little time talking to Mike Shank and <clears throat> during test and race weekend, and then actually Colin and I sat at lunch one of the days on the weekend, and uh, fun asking him, okay, what are you working on? You know what. what <laughs> What does it take to drive this thing quick? And uh, yeah, it, it, it was fun um, uh, kind of doing a little probing and coaching uh, in a subtle way. So um, it, yeah, yeah it's, as always, I mean, those cars are, wow. I, did he tell you how complicated those things are? Yes. I mean, like all the buttons and dials and knobs and break by wire and regen and differential and holy smokes, I'm... It's way beyond me. I'm glad I'm not engineering one of those. It's yeah. It's beyond me. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, I'm sure there were some things that he told me that I'm not supposed to talk about. So I'm not going to talk about them. Although, right. same, hey, same. let's talk. No, no. Hey, hey, let's, here's yeah, a top yeah. secret thing. Yeah. No, yeah. I, 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 I think the uh, some of the top secret stuff that I can probably give away is. You work really hard, design a really good car, test it as much as you can, hire four really good drivers, have a great pit crew, do really good strategy, and boom, you win Daytona. Easy. How hard can it be? Yeah. 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 Done. How hard can it be? <laughs> yeah. Done. Done. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, we do have a lot of questions that piled up while we were away. Goofing and, off. Uh, Goofing off, right? Yeah. Goofing off in sunny Florida. I'm sure you were hanging out at the beach most of the time like I was. I saw you there up on the spotter stand and running around working like crazy and didn't seem much like a vacation, but. Uh, oh, not well. much of a vacation. And yes, my race didn't turn out all that well. So we'll just kind of move on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I saw, I saw your race, but if you're going to not finish the 24 hour Daytona, it's, Earlier rather than later, as I've always thought was better. It's never good. But it's never good. No, no. But it's never good. We we went out. We were leading when we got hit. Um, so yeah, I mean you, you know, uh, as we always say, the best thing about racing is there's always another race. Always another race. Exactly. Yep. Exactly. Yep. No, yep. you guys were the guys. To, you guys were the guys to beat. We were strategizing on how we're going to beat that that yep. that eleven car. So. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Next All one. right. So I we got a question from Jake on email and he sent it to you and he said this is a dumb question for no dumb questions. So I guess it's automatically thrown out. We can't do it. Uh, uh we aimed it at dumb people. You me. 
Oh, so we'll okay, so we'll take it. Yeah, yeah. All right. He says, I live in Northern California, and every track mile I've driven has been at the big three, Laguna, Sonoma, which editors note for me is still Sears Point, but we'll yeah. move on. Yep. <laughs> and, and, and Thunder Hill. All things being equal is track time on a technical track with lots of elevation change and blind turns going to create a better driver. How much does the track's so-called difficulty affect a student's learning curve? Huh. That's not a dumb question. No, yeah. no, it's a, it's a good question. But the simple answer, a lot. Oh, we're done. A lot? <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> actually, I'm, I'm going to... Uh, Something I've said many times, and it's it, you know it's not totally accurate, but it kind of gives a picture, I think, and that is I kind of look at Laguna Seca, Sonoma slash Sears Point. Uh, we'll go with Sonoma here, uh, and Thunder Hill. If you added up the elevation change of those three tracks, I think it adds up to the elevation change for all the other tracks in the country put together. That's what it seems That's, like. Every yep. time I go to those three tracks, I go, ah, oh, the elevation change is so awesome at these tracks. And, and, you know, I've had, uh, and just recently had somebody ask me the question of dealing with blind corners and mm -hmm. Laguna obviously has a blind corner called the corkscrew. Um, uh, you know, really turn six is kind of a blind corner as well. Uh, you know, yeah. Sonoma, I think all but one corner is blind, or at least it seems like that. And <laughs> yeah. Thunder, Thunder Hill has its share of, of blind corners. So I think the things that, so, so, so the question, you know, around uh, will this help a driver's learning curve there? Will they improve more by, by driving tracks like that? I believe so. I believe that if you're on a very simple track, that's, you know, visually easy, uh, you, you, you don't learn a very valuable technique. You, you tend to rely on, what I call physical vision, you know, and, and this is just one area we'll talk about right now. And that's, you know, so much of driving is, is around vision, obviously, but if every corner you approach is I can see through the entire corner, well, I'm not, I'm not going to say you get lazy with your vision, but it's relatively easy. You know, the, the, uh, uh, the first time I ever drove on a street circuit, lined with concrete walls. And every time you come to a corner, you're kind of like, I want to look through the corner. You can't, there's a concrete wall there. And uh, it's interesting. Um, I remember the f one year being racing at in Toronto on the, uh, in an Indy car. And the very last corner was that super fast corner. And the concrete wall came right up to the apex and you couldn't see the X of the corner when you turned in. And I think the following year or the year after, they actually move the wall back. And I think lap times dropped by half a second. And the track, the track geography did not change whatsoever. But the fact that drivers could see through the corner all of a sudden made it easier. So I think that one of the things that you learn with blind corners is how to deal with corners that you can't see. And, you know, I always say, <laughs> The good news is that they don't move the track from lap to lap. It's in the same place every single time. So then you have to rely on your memory or the ability to visualize where the corner is and where I want the car placed when I clip past the apex and start tracking out to the exit. And, you know, most drivers, if you ask them to sit in a chair, close their eyes and imagine driving all of the track, they can do that, even blind corners. But when you're approaching a corner at 60 or 160 miles an hour, can you visualize the exit of the corner and like that immediately? Can you picture it in your mind while you're actually driving and you're not quite there yet, which is a very different thing than, than to be sitting in a chair stationary in a nice, comfortable place. So I think that's a skill that drivers learn from tracks with elevation changes. And, you know, I think with Laguna, Sonoma and Thunder Hill, we're talking, you know, not just elevation, but those are, those are some of the, the highlights of, of those tracks. So I believe mm -hmm. that, that learning how to drive blind corners 
where it's only going to make you better in non-blind corners. So I'd say is it that's the first part. Yeah. Yeah. Is is so your your thing about Toronto when they change the corner, is that a <clears throat> is there is it just because you could see more of the exit, or was it because it was less scary because the wall was moved back? You know, I mean, yes. I, I know the pro guys. It's there's not so okay. Well, that's a good answer. I mean, like like let's say you took, I don't know, take a. A, a corner, um, you know, the kink at Road America. Okay, the wall's kind of close, but make it do one of two things. Move it back 100 yards so it's wide open and it's asphalt and there's nothing to hit. Or move it right up to the wall like Long Beach, like right at the edge of the track, where if you even dip a inch of a wheel, you hit the wall. Uh, the corner is exactly the same, but how does that change? a driver's perspective of it and how they attack it. So, you know, the scary part is it, it drivers will go, well, I wasn't scared there, but we all have a sense of self-preservation and so <laughs> self-preservation doesn't sound so bad as I was scared, you know, what? right, <laughs> right, right. Uh, uh, so but there, that. You, you could you could put it as a as a car standpoint too. Like, hey, I want to win this race. And if I bend my toe link against the wall, I'm not gonna win this race. But if the wall was back 10 feet, I can take a little more chance because I might not bend my toe link. Right. There, so maybe it's not scared, it's also being smart about taking care of your equipment too. Yeah. So there's that risk reward part maybe. of it that every driver should or do that does make while driving. Um, but you know, a, a great analogy or, uh, of this, is, and it's something that I'm not the first to use this, but, you know, take a, a two by eight, that's eight feet long, put it on the ground, walk along the eight inch wide part of it, walk along that <laughs> piece of cake. Yep, I know where you're going. Yeah. Now, easy. Put it up between two step ladders eight feet off the ground. Yeah. Okay. Still most people, you know, they're going to do it, put it up <laughs> 20 stories in the air. And most people are going to be on their hands and knees crawling across the thing. Has right. anything changed about that, but walking across that? Absolutely not. So yeah, for sure. The, so some of it is the physical part of, I, I don't know where I'm going. I can't see it. So it's harder to right. judge you know, just how much to turn the wheel, all that kind of stuff. And again, that's where you got to rely on your memory or the ability to visualize where the rest of the corner is as you approach it. That's the technical part of that. But yes, the other part of it is it's the self-preservation. It's the, uh, you know, our mind tends to focus on, <laughs> because we're human so often, our mind tends to focus on what bad could happen uh, <laughs> and and that's yeah. where our mind goes and sure. you know falling off of a a two by eight that's sitting on the ground not much bad can happen 20 stories right. up something bad could happen and, and right. i would right. say that that's an area where you know certainly the very very best drivers are better at than the rest they have the ability to uh, first of all, stay focused on on what is important, but also, you know, even if their mind starts to go, what bad could happen? They boom, right back to what am I focused on right now? Walking across this two by eight or, you know, clipping past this concrete wall or cresting this hill and not really quite knowing where the exit of the corner is. So uh, yeah. that's that's what the best drivers, that's an ability the best drivers have. And, you know, so going back, to to the question here is uh, um, is is there something to learn by doing that? For sure, that's that's a skill that if you've never driven at those kinds of tracks, you're just not going to get as good at. So, so the difficulty, the the technicality or the difficulty is makes for better drivers mm -hmm. than 
I, because they, I guess they can apply that if they're good at difficult corners or ones they can't see or ones with elevation, they can apply that to corners that are less difficult and they have more bandwidth ability to, to draw on because they're good at difficult corners, I guess. Yeah. So like, um, uh, my mind goes blank. What are the, the parking lot races, solos and stuff like that? I mean, those are super autocross. They're really technical and, Yep. But I guess you can see pretty good. You can see good in those, but those are technical corners that are really, they're slow, but they're still, you better be precise or you're going to get beat. Yeah. And, and actually, I, you know, to, to say that autocross, it's easier to see. It is to some extent, but the the skill that great autocrossers have is, you know, you, you could be just looking at this parking lot with a sea of orange cones up there. Cones, yeah. yeah. And yet the very best... <clears throat> It's almost like they don't see the cones; they just see the pathway in between them. So it's mm-hmm. it's very similar to driving on a street circuit or going through blind corners, where they can visualize that path, and that's a skill that that they have developed, and why so many good autocrossers become great road racers or road course drivers because they've had that ability to 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 visualize that part of it. So I think, you know, right. that's certainly part of it. You touched on something else where you said, because it's more difficult and it just relates to, I just happened to be doing some simulator coaching this morning. And, you know, one of the, I don't want to give away all my secrets, but <laughs> but if I were to Wait, give away a secret. Books, you, wrote, you wrote tons of books, which is all secrets. You still have some that you haven't given away? Well, you know, one of the things that one of the great parts of using a simulator as a, as a training tool is you can deliberately make the car harder to drive. And, mm-hmm. yeah. and by the way, Jeff, I pretend I play that I'm I'm you. I pretend that I'm you, <laughs> but only to a certain extent, because every time you make a change, you make the car better. What I do is yeah. I deliberately make the car worse and have the driver drive a car that is worse. I make the car yeah. oversteer. And, and, you know, going back to, hey, it's what we did with Colin a long time ago, right? Was right. we would deliberately make the car handle poorly so yep. that he learned how to adapt to that. And that, I mean, it does two things. It, it, it builds the data, the driver's database of how do I deal, what techniques can I use to do this? But it also gives them confidence. And it gives them the confidence right. that kind of no matter what, I can deal with this. And 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 even if I've driven a really bad car and now I get a really good car, man, this is easy. So right. I, I, there, there's a lot of, you know, go, and, go to Laguna, go to Sonoma, go to Thunder Hill, and go and drive those tracks and maybe you're going to go to some other tracks. And I'm not saying that other tracks are necessarily easier, but there are some tracks that are easier and you go to those tracks and it's like, you know, I can, I can drive this with two hands drive tied behind my back kind of thing. Right. 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 Ah, yeah. That's, that makes sense. And, and you've given me a good, a good thing. You said you've made the car, at times deliberately worse. So I make the car worse quite often, but I've never, so now I'm going to say, oh, when they say, oh, that was worse, that change was worse. I'm going to say, yeah, you know, Ross said to make it deliberately worse. That's what, that's what you wanted, right? <laughs> so, because I'm really good at that. I've, I've made my career at making it, making it worse. I just never admitted that. I'd never told anybody it was deliberately. I just wasn't thinking. I thought, so that's a good, that's a good point. I'm going to use that from now on. Deliberately worse. I'm, I'm going to argue with you here because of all the cars of you, <laughs> that you engineered that I drove, you never made one worse. You always made them better. So, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, but oh, uh, that's that. That's well, a good. Uh, yeah, I like that. The whole elevate. So how much? You know, we talked a lot about blind corners, but one of one of Jake's big points was the elevation. I guess that makes it blind on the kind of the down. I'm well, thinking of Thunder Hill where you go off the jump. You don't really see where you're going. 
So yeah. it's blind vertically rather than horizontally, I guess, right. is what same thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I guess the other thing that that you learn on tracks with elevation, even if there are areas that are not blind, is how to use the elevation. And I think if you only ever drove a track that was perfectly flat, you would probably uh, assume or judge most brake zones, corners as having the same grip level. But the second you brake, you know, think about braking at, into turn one at Coda, which is strong uphill, and then kind of just kind of starts to plateau a little bit, you know, versus braking for turn 11 or turn 12 at Coda, which are fairly flat or maybe a little bit downhill. You have to learn yeah. how to adapt your braking to the, the the changing elevation. And the same thing, I mean, there are corners, I'm just trying to think of a, of a really good example of a corner where, you know, perhaps you you come into the corner downhill, well, turn, turn five at Laguna Seca. You know, you sort of come into that corner kind of a little bit downhill but then in the middle of the corner it goes uphill and or yeah how about um sorry turn six at come out of six at watkins Glen, go down the hill and then seven is uphill to the right yeah where it yeah. plasters you into the into the corner there i yeah. kind of like like you said like five at laguna yeah so so you learn how to use that and you know <clears throat> laguna is a great example turn five is a great example of if you turn into that corner with the speed that is required for the first half of the corner, you're going to overslow mm -hmm. because you have to turn in and have the car go. I don't have enough grip. I don't have enough grip. I don't have enough grip. Hit the compression of the hill going uphill. And all of a sudden the car goes, ah, we got grip. And, but if you drove the car to that limit of, of to the first half of the corner, you wouldn't be taking advantage of the elevation. And I would say that a lot of drivers at go to Laguna and turn five, they underdrive the corner because they're not taking advantage of the elevation in the second half of the corner. So same kind of thing mm -hmm. at seven into, into at Watkins Glen, um, lots of those places. So yeah, I, again, I think that driving those types of tracks, it just, it, it's that driver database. And right you know, the best drivers have more ways of driving corners than other drivers. Yeah. Well, yeah. I think Jake's lucky if every mile he's driven is at Laguna, Sonoma, and Thunderhill. <laughs> Holy moly. Yeah. Can he pick any? <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. all right. You pretty much hit it. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> well, Jeff, uh, I got a question for you. Well, I, I have all a right. question that uh, Matt sent in to us. And uh, a timely one, because uh, Matt says, hey, Jeff, congrats again on a very successful weekend at the 24 Hours. I was watching some of the race, and I remember one of the first stints when Colin was in the car, he was making a pass, and they made a comment about him getting away from the side draft. This made me think about drafting. It's so common to hear about, and it's very well known. Yeah, I'm not sure I can say I completely understand all the parameters, ramifications. It has such a huge effect in every category from Formula One to MX5. And by the way, watch the MX5 race from Daytona. Woo, another great one. Watch, um, watch every MX5 race. Yeah, just yeah. everyone. It, yep. Especially if you want to know anything about drafting. But um, right. so, <laughs> so to finish, Matt, he says, not to mention it's a standard in NASCAR. I have many questions, but would love to hear your and Ross's perspective on it. So. Uh, my perspective is, listen to Jeff. <laughs> yeah, well, we'll talk about the driver part of it. I can, I, I'll talk about how this, like, like the side draft works, because a lot of people yeah. don't understand side drafting. So let me explain what it is first for some that might not even know. A car is driving along, and you normally see it in NASCAR. It's a big, big NASCAR thing, side drafting, and it works the same in sports cars. Maybe not quite as effectively as in NASCAR. But like what Matt was saying about Colin, he he, he did this tech, same technique. He learned it when he was at doing NASCAR racing and it works in sports cars. So cars driving along in the banking, another car's got to run and it's catching, catching, catching. And it's maybe on the high side 
of the first car. And you'll see that car maybe up near the wall and the other car kind of in the middle or toward the bottom. And the, the car catching will kind of dive down toward the car lower and almost like it's going to run its nose straight into the door of the other car. And it gets right to it where the nose is almost touching the door. It'll stay there right side by side for maybe a second or two and then pull straight away from it back up to the wall. And it slows down the car it was it was catching. It actually slows that car down. And people are like, how can that be? It's some aerodynamic thing, right? And the answer is yes. And the easiest way I can describe it in a non-video podcast is think of a car driving along <clears throat> and it it's knocking the air out of the way, right? The air is hitting the nose and the air is going around the car, kind of in a V-shape, almost like a wake kind of thing. So there's there's air coming off the nose at like a 45 degree angle from the car. And the car is kind of in this wake with those the, the two V-shaped parts of the air coming off. By running your car kind of at the door of the other car, that wake that's coming off the left front of your nose in a V, that wake strikes the wing or the spoiler in an NASCAR car directly. So what you're doing is you're putting the, the, the wash off the front of your car directly on the rear wing of the car you're trying to pass. And that adds drag, lots of drag to that car. And it slows that car down. The trick is, that's great. But if you stay there too long, he slows down and now your nose is equal to his nose and his wash is now on your rear wing mm -hmm. and you slow down and it bogs both cars down. So the side draft has to work where you come from high at the car, produce that wash off of your nose onto his rear wing, slow him down and then pull quickly away. So that you've kind of bogged him down, put his brakes on, his aerodynamic brake on, but then got away from it before his aerodynamic wash hits your rear wing. And that's how the side draft works. And so if you watch NASCAR races, you'll see that they'll come in and then pull away. And that's what Matt saw Colin do, came into one of the cars, did that, and then very abruptly pulled straight away from it so that the wash of the car he was slowing down didn't get on his wing and slow him down so so that's how the side draft <laughs> so so in some ways it's you know we think of drafting as we come up behind another car and the car in front is blocking the air so we kind of get this uh almost like a little it's like a negative pressure or suction almost back there sucking the car along be up to it and the car pulls out and then goes and uses that momentum to go by in this case, yep. it's not so much like it's 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 not so much it's helping the passing car get a big advantage as much as it's giving the other car a disadvantage. Is that right? Right. Yep. Yep. Exactly. You're actually using it to slow the other car. You can actually slow the other car down. In a normal draft, you're speeding your car up. Here, you're slowing your competitor down. And now you got to think about how effective that can be. If, if you are racing cars like an MX-5 car doesn't really have maybe a big wing or a big spoiler or something like that, the side draft is going to be less effective and may, maybe not even work. Um, NASCAR cars with big six-inch spoilers it's a nice big thing to hit against for that air to hit against and slow them down. But wouldn't it, uh, you know, then we get into the, you know, what does a NASCAR, what does a cup car have horsepower wise these days? 700, 800 horsepower. I mean, we don't know yeah. what they are on the right. speed. You know, a Miata has got an MX five has got, I don't know what, what they have right. horsepower wise. So even if there's just a little bit of turbulence off that MX five though, uh, isn't that going to have maybe just as much of an uh, impact as as a car that does that has a lot more horsepower? The horsepower can kind of power it, through some of it. 
uh, exactly. just a little it, bit it more. Could. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, there are a lot of teams and manufacturers that will actually run two cars in the wind tunnel. It's done, done in NASCAR in scale model all the time. And they will run their cars at various two cars side by side at the angle of like a side draft nose to tail to see how they draft. Um, you know, you could design what you'd like to do is design your car so that it didn't, another car couldn't draft it very well when it yeah. got behind it, it, it didn't suck right up to it. You know, and, and when it got a car side by side with it, it wasn't affected very much by the side draft and got slowed down. So if the rules allow it, you'll, that's an important thing is, oh man, that car doesn't, I can't draft very well. I can't draft that car very well. Well, that's an advantage. Yeah. Um, I can't dr side draft that car. It just doesn't slow down when I get next to it. It doesn't slow down as much as the other ones. That's an advantage. So there's car design and there's driver technique. <clears throat> And there's uh, there's a time to do it, and there's a time not to do it. And the side draft is it's a lot about timing. Uh, that's a driver thing, and some of it's a feel thing. You know, they said what Dale Earnhardt could see air. Well, that's kind of what he was doing. He was pra he he practiced that enough to know that when I'm I'm at his rear quarter panel, it doesn't work very good. But I get to his door, it works great. But if I go to his front tire. Now he's slowing me down as much as I'm slowing him down. So I need to get away from it. And there's a lot of skill in that. You know, I haven't watched enough MX5 races for side drafting. I don't see it very much, but man, you watch him at Daytona and you see him nose to tail and, and who's in the right spot. And, and you can see when they pull out, they both slow down, even though they're maybe not side drafting. So it's a thing where you have to practice it. You have to understand it. There's no, you know, some guys are really good at it. Some guys aren't so good at it. Um, I remember when Colin was doing NASCAR, when he had never done any of that stuff, he was not so good at it at first. And toward the end, he got really good at it because yeah. you're going to lose if you're not good at it. It's as simple yeah. as that. Well, I have a, uh, I, an idea. I think that uh, we should get three MX-5 cup cars and you, me, and Colin go to Daytona and we spend a day or two just playing with that and figuring it out. And so we can come back and answer answer the non-dumb <laughs> questions because this is a good one. And, and, and actually, so Jeff, here's another one that uh, it's kind of related to that. Um, and, and I think it'd be great if you explain this is in May, we're going to be watching Indy cars at the Speedway. And for qualifying, you're going to see one car on track. So there's no drafting of another car. But you're going to see the cars go through turn one, turn two. And as soon as they get to the back straight, they start to swoop down to the middle of the track. And then just before they get to the turn in point for four, they swoop back up towards the wall. And then I got on the same thing out of turn four and onto the front straight. Um, Explain that for people because I because I think it's it, it's another fascinating piece. It's it's not unlike the side draft effect when when you're up against the wall there, you're actually creating like a venturi effect, like the you know at a ninety degree angle, you have a venturi effect like tunnels under the car where you're compressing the air under the car and then expelling it out the diffuser quickly a car against the wall is a venturi effect you're squeezing that air between the car and the wall and when that air is is being compressed it creates drag as it's speeding up and so they want to get away from that wall so they're not compressing the air against the wall because there's a lot of air coming off the tires off the wing off the side pods and that air is going to hit the wall be compressed and slow their car down so they're trying to pull away from it the side draft it's it's really like side drafting the wall or you don't want to side draft the wall you don't want to compress your own air speed it up and have it flow against over your own wing 
and slow you down. So it's, you don't want to side draft the wall because yeah. you're going to slow yourself down. Uh, they obviously go up against the wall. And some people, this maybe you can talk to, you've driven it Indy. Is there really a little air cushion where you go flinging out of turn four and you're up against the wall and it kind of, kind of supports you a little bit where like you've compressed the air against there and it's, it's, you know, it's not a sprint car dirt cushion, but it's an air cushion where it's like kind of bounces you off of that. Or is that a myth? Well, I'd like to say that, it, you know, in my 18 years of running the 500, uh, I noticed that, but uh, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, I can remember talk about that when I went to the Speedway to go through rookie orientation and try to qualify and do all that kind of stuff. And, and, you know, I, I think, I think I, I sensed it maybe once. Uh, yeah. But as you know, cause you've been there engineering 86 cars in one team one year, but uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> half the field, it seemed like, but uh, right. you know, that from one from one session to the other, from one day to the other, the weather, uh, the conditions change and the car and track can change so dramatically there. It's, it's, it's like, you know, the temperature drops three degrees and you'd think that you're driving a different track. And, yeah. you know, what I recall, one of my great memories of, of and I'm not going to say it was a strong what let's say a strong memory I'm not sure it was a great memory but it was a strong memory <laughs> uh, of, of being there and you know on a practice day having the car dialed in where it was you know drivers will talk about it at the speedway where you're just like it was almost like it was driving itself it was just so easy to drive foot nailed to the floor flat out all the way around car track out you got you know that little cushion and that's where i kind of felt like maybe there is that little cushion there and i remember coming back the next day and i forget we were like five miles an hour slower and i'm hanging on for dear life and i remember coming into the pits after you know a run of eight ten laps or something like that i come into the pits and the guys are looking at the the right side tires and going white walled it and I'd come out of turn wow. two and just scrape the wall coming out of it. And but it was so, it was so soft that there might have been that air cushion there because I didn't yeah. even know it. But I, you know, the sides of the tires are now white uh, from me yeah. just scraping against Ooh. the wall. And 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 yet and yet we were going slower, but the conditions Whoa. had changed. Yeah. And yeah. again, maybe you know, I think other drivers have barely touched the wall at the speedway and if somebody didn't tell them they touched it they wouldn't have known so maybe wouldn't there is that yeah. little there is that little tiny cushion there a little bit so um again yeah, i think sense. i think i think uh, i think we need to go back and do some more testing so yeah. let's do let's do that well yeah you know that made me think of another thing uh setup wise it's there are times and mostly i did it with single seaters where you had you know front wings to deal with is a big consideration is the draft or the turbulence or how good you can follow another car so you know matt talked about drafting and understanding it drafting can be a good thing because you can suck up on a car and get a draft but it can also being too close to another car can really screw up the handling of your car the, a modern prototype is really susceptible to drafting in a corner because you lose a bunch of front downforce because this turbulent air is coming off. You lose the front downforce under your splitter. Indy cars, Formula One cars lose it off the front wing. And suddenly they have this massive understeer and they just can't pass. Uh, GT cars have that problem really bad. Watch an SRO race. I mean, it's going to finish how they qualify. You just can't pass anybody because the you get close to them and you have no front grip anymore, and you can't pass a guy with no front grip. Yeah. It's we can get into the whole why that makes racing bad, but that's why we have things like push to pass and DRS because when you follow a modern high downforce aerodynamic car closely, you can't pass them, so you need some 
aids DRS, push extra horsepower, something like that to help pass them. And I'll go back to, I'll go to the GTP, current GTP regulations. They made those cars. If you look at them closely, compare them to a DPI of last year, they have a lot less dive planes, a lot less widgets, a lot less flicks, a lot less intricate, fancy front aerodynamics. And that was by IMSA's design and IMSA's rules because they wanted the cars not to be so affected by following another car. And so you look at the Porsche, it's a smooth, kind of looks, you know, like a retro 70s or 80s prototype. And that's because they don't have all those little flicks for the air to move over and disrupt and everything. They're relying much less on the front of the car and all the trick little aero widgets to make their downforce so they can follow closer and they can draft guys in high speed corners where they couldn't before. Well, actually, just, maybe maybe we'll wrap up on this on this note. But, okay. you know, I think I think it's pretty it's pretty impressive that uh, you know it's Im- i guess imsa probably aco all sorts of fia whatever you know they they come with these standards and design and rules and regulations and stuff like that and the very first race all these gtp cars go to daytona and they qualify and what the difference from first to sixth in the gtps were like three tenths of a second I mean, it, it, it was amazing. It was kind of, and you know, you have very, very, very different approaches to achieve the same thing, all within those regulations, right? So, it, it I mean, it's pretty impressive that, uh, you know, that you can put in these regulations, and designers, engineers will go, and they're just like, it's like they just bumped up against that ceiling, and yes, I'm sure, you know, a year from now they'll all be whatever two seconds quicker or whatever, but. Uh, uh, you know, you, you have engineers, designers all coming from the same thing, trying to achieve the same goal and, and they get there in many, many different ways because you look at the, the Porsche, you look at the Cadillacs, you look at the Acuras, you look at the BMWs and they're very, very different looking cars. And yet they're all pretty darn close. So exactly with very different motors. And, and I will say, I I know we're way off t- topic, but I think that's what people like, right? And, yeah. and it's our show, so we can go off topic. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that was a cool uh, IMSA. You know, they're not going to BOP those cars that much. You're not going to see weight getting on and power restrictors and all that kind of stuff because everybody has the same power, and yeah. they measure that by the torque of the rear wheels. They don't care if you have a big honking V8 like the Cadillac or a tiny little twin turbo like the Acura. You have the same power. Yeah. You have the same basically aerodynamics because they took them all to the wind tunnel and they have the same downforce and the same drag. There was a small box that each manufacturer could put itself in and it put itself in that box. So it's going to come down to car setup. It's almost like a spec car. Yeah. It's a spec performance. But you can get there different ways. So the cars look different. The Porsche does not look at all like the BMW or like the Acura or like the Cadillac. It's, yeah. it's cool. They all have their own look, but they're all going to perform within that box. And man, they nailed it. As you said, 0.3 seconds for across the across the field. It's, that was impressive. I think it's going to be pretty cool. Now, we could get on a, a, a long discussion, which I, we've touched on this on the podcast before. but. Uh, wouldn't it be great if they just said, uh, just build the cars as fast as you can make them and go race them. Uh, then we got to get a whole different thing, but yeah, again, uh, yeah, a different topic for another day. <laughs> different. Right. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. No, that was good. That was good. Yeah. Uh, that was, that was fun. So that's, that's what I know about drafting. Um, okay. I hope that answered Matt's question. <clears throat> Sounds great. And, uh, Hey, uh, as you're listening to this and you have an idea or a question, um, send it our way, you know, the usual, you know, send it by email to me at info at speed secrets, uh, Jeff on social media, myself on social media, or as happened last weekend at Daytona, three people came up and asked questions and said, Hey, I got, 
something you and Jeff should talk about. So um, if you see us at the track, come and uh, come and tell us. So um, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Well, Jeff, uh, well, I will wrap this up, I guess. I hope everybody has has fun and it must be having fun if they're, you know, like the first question, if they're racing at those three tracks, that's got to be a lot of fun. So yeah. keep doing that and um, we'll catch you next time. And maybe not the next time, but the time after that, we will have just gotten back from Sebring. So we'll move on to that one. Too. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, It'll be yeah. fun. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Keep having fun. Thanks. Have fun.